Flights from Sydney to London in two hours could be possible during the next decade by travelling through space. Joining us live with more on this is Fred Watson, Australia's astronomer at large. Fred, good to see you. Thank you for your time. This sounds pretty tempting, but just tell us, what would that actually do to the average person's body? Just popping up to space for a bit on the way to some sightseeing in London, perhaps? Yeah, we, you know, we normally associate spaceflight with uh, years of training and medical tests and checks and everything. But uh, the reason why this story is in the news is that a study has been carried out in the United Kingdom on what this type of suborbital travel, uh, which means going uh, in a spacecraft not into orbit, but uh, in a, su uh, a suborbital flight, which takes you from A to B on the surface of the Earth very quickly, what would that sort of travel do to the average person? And it turns out, that the average person would be quite happy uh, to undergo that in terms of their uh, physiology, the, the fact that their health would uh, be quite robust enough usually to, to cope with it. And the bit I liked is that older people would have probably a smaller effect on them than younger people because their arteries are a little bit stiffer than younger people's arteries, which in the normal course of events is a bad thing. But in, in the acceleration that you would experience going into space, it actually stops the blood pooling away from your brain, which means that you don't lose consciousness. Plenty of time, I think, for you, Fred, to give this sort of thing a go, realistically. <laughs> What sort of time frame are we really talking, though, in terms of when this might be available to the masses? Well, yes, the media are talking about 10 years. Uh, and I, I should, just to set the context, we're on the brink of an era of space tourism. I've been saying that for the last decade, but I really think it's happening now with organisations like Virgin Galactic, whose uh, space plane you can see on the screen at the moment. Uh, they take passengers up and down. Basically, you go up into space, you're in space for about three minutes and weightless, and then you come back down to Earth and usually land in more or less the same place where you took off. Uh, but the idea of extending that so that you don't land in the same place as you took off uh, has been around for a very long time with um, perhaps these uh, single point flights going up and down being uh, in the, uh, you know, in the business very soon. We might see a time when the first experimental point to point flights going long distances, trans, uh, transcontinental flights could be starting tests within a few years. The pundits are saying 10 years before it becomes commercially available, but my guess is that at that time it would be commercially available only to a very few very, very wealthy people indeed who uh, would have the, the need perhaps to get from one place to another in a couple of hours. OK, just picking up on something you said there about being weightless during that sort of flight, what do you envision that sort of flight would be like? I mean, I assume everyone would have to be pretty strapped in? Would we need to wear some sort of special outfit? I guess the food and beverage service might be a bit restricted. <laughs> Toilet breaks could be tricky. How would it work? <laughs> Yes, as far as I know, there is no toilet on the um, on the uh, Virgin Galactic space plane, so uh, you've got to cope with that uh, somehow. But look, it, it would be um, pretty. I mean, the tense bits come at the beginning and at the end. Uh, so with Virgin Galactic, you're uh, in a space plane that's trapped underneath a more conventional aircraft. That carries it up to about 16 kilometres. The space plane is released and its rocket motor fires. And for something like 90 seconds, you have really quite serious accelerations, up to about four times the normal acceleration, that we, uh, the, the, the force of gravity that we feel here on Earth, perhaps four Gs as we talk about. And that would be the bit where you would certainly be strapped in possibly wearing some sort of pressure clothing to stop uh, the blood pooling, as I mentioned. But then there will be a period of, yes, perhaps the bulk of the flight, maybe an hour or so, when you are free to move around the cabin, you will experience weightlessness, you'll see the curvature of the Earth before the deceleration starts. And there you're subject again to really quite high accelerations, perhaps even higher than on the initial rocket flight, uh, rocket burn to start with. No alcohol served on those flights, so uh, you'd suggest. In terms of how that would actually work logistics-wise, I mean, we'd need a whole new global air traffic control system, wouldn't we? If we had space flights taking off all over the place, that sounds pretty complicated from that perspective. 
Uh, yeah, I think there will be just a few very select hubs that would have the, that kind of facility. And uh, for somebody uh, with an accent like mine living in Australia, uh, the hope is very high that one of those hubs might be London. Not that I'll ever be able to afford it. But the, the bottom line is uh, that uh, air traffic control is already set up to handle the kind of suborbital flights that are being planned for space tourism. So uh, my guess is that it would be Probably a fairly significant, but nevertheless, just an extension of that that would take us into the future realm of multiple space flights happening with fair paying passengers all over the world. Fred, just how expensive is it? Sounds like you've looked into it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. Um, look, the current fare for a Virgin Galactic flight, and that is going up to the edge of space, uh, about, um, well, in their case, it's about 80 kilometres, 50 miles, and then a return down to Earth. The fare for that at the moment is, in Australian dollars, a cool 650,000. Um, but... Richard Branson and the Virgin Galactic executives are very keen to tell us that the fare will come down uh, as this becomes a more routine, uh, a more routine situation. They draw the parallel between the early years of aviation when it cost you an arm and a leg to get on an aeroplane and go from one place to another. Now we we all do it really with with uh, relatively modest expenditure. Uh, the hope is that this kind of space travel will. Uh, come down in price. Maybe in 30, 20, 30 years, you might find that it's cheap enough for most of us to afford. Well, Fred Watson, you are our astronomer at large. I feel like you'd be a pretty good <laughs> ambassador for uh, an Australian to give this a go. Maybe we should have a chat with uh, someone in charge of government grants or get some crowdfunding happening for you. <laughs> it sounds like it would uh, be a blast. Fred Watson, fascinating to chat with you as always. Thank you. Many thanks, Ashley. Thank you.